ready? All right, I think we're going to get started. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me now? Wonderful. If you want to find a seat, so good to be here with you all tonight for the first event of the Poetry Project's Fall 2022 season. My name is Laura Henriksen. I am the program director here at the Poetry Project, and I'm so glad to be here with you tonight for the first event in a three-part series organized by our incredibly brilliant curatorial fellows, Chang Yu Chen and Fan Wu, working together as Mogalu Obo. Um, it's been an unmatched joy collaborating with them for everyone on the Poetry Project staff, and I'm so excited and honored to be here with them tonight and with all of the really brilliant writers and thinkers and organizers that they've brought together and invited into this space. Before I turn it over to Mogalu Obo, I wanted to spend a little time reflecting more deeply with you all on how it came to pass that we are gathered together in this room tonight. What conditions made this gathering possible and its many possible meanings. I invite us each to consider the multiplicities of circumstances, choices, surprises, mistakes, miracles, friends, teachers, and ancestors, without each of whom it would not be possible for us to be together tonight. If it feels safe to, I invite us all to try and sense how these many presences are with us in this room, even if we perhaps cannot see them. And if it feels right to, I invite us all to use this moment to offer our gratitude and to think about what we might want to do or how we might want to be now that we are here together. If history is a kind of language and if places are kinds of stories, then this room that we are in now is, among other things, a ghost story. It's a story that holds the realities and legacies of settler colonization and enslavement, of displacement and erasure, and also of resistance and faith, vulnerability and courage. Like any ghost story, I think it is also a love story. Its sounds and syllables are for the past and for the future and for all of us right now in this shared moment, which holds everything. I always like to close these reflections by invoking a teaching from Gloria Anzaldúa. She reminds us, this land was Lenape Hoking always and is and will be again. Tonight, as we explore listening and unlistening, seemingly contradictory symbolic meanings and the languages of New York, I invite us to think about how we can participate in the work Anzal Dua lays out for us of transformative recognition, changing our language, our ways of being together, being with the land, the land being returned. Thank you for reflecting on this with me. Before I turn it over to Mogaluobo, I just have a couple last space reminders. One is to please keep your masks on for the duration of the time that you are inside. We have a restroom upstairs and also one on the first floor. If you need to access that one, just find me or Roberto or anyone on staff or volunteers and we can help you get to that restroom. I think that's everything from me. So now I am so pleased and delighted to turn it over to Mogaluobo. Oh, hello. Louder? Ah, okay. Hi. Um, you woke up today. You ate something. You wondered if it might rain. And then you decided to come to Poetry Project for this experiment. You have my word. You make us happy through your being here. You will experience a series of happenings that involve languages that don't yet properly exist. Lovers called hypotrophic dialects, 
asymmetric writing, the bad and the wrong and the A signifying sound, the semantic sense melting down into somatic sensuality. You may also, in one way or another, collaborate with us tonight and the wonderful artists and scholars who will present tonight, tomorrow night, and the night after. The stage that separates audience from performer will be gleefully blurred. Your name is Fan Wu, and tonight you're Mo Gu. Your name is Chang Yu Chen, but tonight you are Luo Bo. Mm. You live in Toronto. And you live in Queens? Yes. Where you love the food. Yes. Um, <laughs> You went to Hong Kong in 2019 for a art book fair on behalf of Art Metropole. And from across the room, you walked to me. And you pointed at some books by Ed Ruscha and Richard Prince that are in glass case. And you said, why are they cased? To your question, I answered, because they're rare. And you pointed at the rest of the books and asked, what are these? And I said, medium rare. <laughs> <laughs> this is just the index of how permission giving you are just with your presence. It's this evil smirk on your face <laughs> that is warm and wicked, so ready for punchline, so ready to be entertained. And you at that very same art book fair, I asked you, what kind of a liquid would you like to drink? Perhaps not in those words. And you answered, I want mulled wine. <laughs> mulled wine in the middle of Hong Kong. And I thought, that's an unreasonable and powerful demand. <laughs> and by then, I was already under your spell. My friend calls you sorceress. You have a sorceress aura. In your dresses, you seem to float above everything. And it seems impossible to speak to you about pragmatics because we're so much in the zone. <laughs> in so much in the zone of, of language and play. Uh, you joined me for a podcast conversation in 2021 in which we discovered that you are mogu. Mogu is mushroom. You are this fruit that bears spores. You duplicate in space and you spread in time. For you, past, present, and future all converge. For you, the imminent peripheral and the archaic far away is one and the same thing. And in contradistinction, we learned that you were Luo Bo, the dangled carrot of the future that promises a chase that lasts for infinity, that you believe that there's always a future that's worth sacrificing the present for in this dangled carrot temporality, and that your solo practice of creating a choral dictionary, which you'll speak more about tomorrow, is this culmination of everything into the carrot form of the solo practice. And you, on the other hand, have no goals. <laughs> you have no ego, you have no boundary. Your selfhood is made of a collective tissue. <laughs> you, Lobo, have been wounded by growing up under communism's flattening of difference um, under communist China, so that the assertion of your ego becomes a response to that violence. You say that with so much certainty. <laughs> um, you, that I've heard from afar, host a lot of workshops, and you call them social curation. And because of COVID, I get a pleasure to participate on Zoom, in which you showed me that pedagogy is a form of art and it is the art of hospitality. It is the art of making space. It is art of relational aesthetics. You showed me that it is possible to be together with a group of people without being violently reduced. You teach me about George Steiner and Li Young Li and Theodore Adorno in a motion of back and forth pedagogy. But more than theory proper, with you, there are lessons about grief's longevity, long nights of talking about love, and many WhatsApp sessions where we double over in hysterical laughter. And among those laughters, you were asked to join me to write this application <laughs> for a curatorial fellowship at Poetry Project. 
um, it is for public events. But you insisted on adding on a residency component because you believe in eating, living, and breathing together, exchanging molecules before we exchange our words. And you let this fantasy of mine that we might bring five Toronto artists in contact with five New York artists um, into this residency space, you let that fantasy run amok until one day the people at Poetry Project wonderfully um, paired us up with an artist residency, the Elizabeth Murray Artist Residency. And we were shocked with the shock of a fantasy come true. If any of you know that feeling, it's so deadly to have one of your fantasies come true. Um, you brought with you a microclimate from Toronto. You all finish each other's sentences. You all tell each other's stories at wild parties. You all snuggle up on couch together, so cozy, and they enter each other's practice with mind and body fully. And for these events, you've invited guest artists, people you admire from the New York landscape whose practices in your mind are all deeply entangled, even though they perhaps haven't met each other until tonight. Mm -hmm. They continuously have conversations inside your head, and we're so glad to have Ross and Tamara with us tonight. Um, you are meeting some of them for the first time tonight, and you will meet more tomorrow and more Friday night. Um, you will be wrapped around by a various of relationalities. Some of intense initial encounters will be mixed up with some long and stretched out friendships. And you will experience a diversity of temporalities and how languages are marinated differently within them. You've all just been witness now to this flirtatious podcast between us that is in essence the form of our curatorial method, rooted in love, rutabagas in love, a mycelial network that grows by openness. And you should be ready to get more serious now. <laughs> you wrote an essay, Twilight Zone of the Tongue, Veniet, of the translingualism, in which you said, Translingualism challenges hegemonic monolingualism from within. Under capitalism, a global, techno, bureaucratic form of monolingualism attempts to commandeer language by bending it to teleologies um, of market value, efficiency, and advertising. But monolingualism is susceptible to internally splitting off into creolization, hybridities, and dialects that forge their desire and aims. So English, for example, is not a language, but a tool with which to build real, live, active languages. Translingualism is an act of resistance in language against the forces that would narrow its potentials for the sake of consolidating power. And you wrote an essay around the same time called After After Babel, in which you said, you, in which you said that I said that English is not a language. I don't remember saying this. Um, English is not a language as there's nothing intrinsic about it. And another friend of yours who moved to the US from Israel about 10 years ago, uh, ago told you that she found herself speaking to her newborn baby in Hebrew only. And she said, English is not a language you speak to a baby. English is a language for business. And although that friendship has been based in English, it's not entirely business. The two of you became allies in the business of grad school and later on in the business of making a living in New York City, as many of you know. But you two also shared the pains and joys of life, big and small, you would talk. It took great effort on both of your parts with your limited vocabularies and occasionally incoherent grammar that are wrong in different ways, which bore the vestiges of your different mother tongues like a birthmark on the brain. But you still easily connect with other diasporic beings because you feel when diasporic beings talk, it's not only the legitimate verbal exchanges that are at work, but the errors are also effective currency conveying struggle and compromise, contradiction and ambiguity, the comical and the cunning. I know how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Later in that essay, you mentioned you're leaving China at the age of four. You have no memory but a few photographs. You wrote, the sounds and the rhythm of Mandarin are forgotten nostalgias that haunt me. In my thoughts, I still count numbers, work multiplications, tables, and identify fruits in Chinese. My English is still half lit by Mandarin, even as my real knowledge of it has faded into a kindergarten set of nouns. The rhythms of the Tang poem that my grandparents recited for me still weigh their way into how I write poetry. And in the very musicality of my inner year, Mandarin compresses, composes my sonic unconsciousness. The language you speak, English, where you feel yourself to have the most communicative power, is founded on a loss, whose resonant traces shape it in ways that excited your knowledge and are buried deep in your intuitions, such as you wrote, In this foreign linguistic territory, I have no luxury of ornamentation, no access to abundance, nor am I equipped for subtlety when I speak English. I've noticed my voice becoming much more tentative, and my sentences often go up in tone at the end, because besides whatever I am saying, I am also forever asking, am I saying what I think I'm saying? Entering my 10th year living in the United States, I find myself mastering not English, but instead inhabiting inferiority, the art of understatement, the audacity to raise painfully banal questions, and the technique of stretching a moment out. At a random locus within a sentence, in search of an elusive word, I indulge myself with a long, long pause while everyone waits, including time. The famously unstoppable stream of consciousness has to stop for me. For what is a thought before we find it a name? You are melancholy about what you call your underdeveloped English, though I'd wager it's rarely experienced as underdeveloped by those around you, judging by the way you <laughs> masterfully explained what a Persian rug was the other day. <laughs> um. But we lost that game. <laughs> um, <laughs> you are grieving about what you call your deteriorating Mandarin, but you hold this grief and you attend to the bigger world and bigger context. You believe the maladjustments with language is a ontological condition, not only limited to the visibly geographically diasporas. You believe and identify with translingualism, which, quote, affirm that we are all monolingual because all the languages and idioms we speak make up a continuum that is singular language of our own subjectivity. And, they were, and we are not even monolingual because no language properly belongs to us and neither language itself nor our subject grasp of it ever coheres into a monolingual oneness. You and I, <laughs> we both hold dear to our past and future loss. Um, and from that negative space, we carve out our personal dialects. Yet, there are other forms of loss, some more irretrievable, some more violent, some more hidden, some more dangerous. Um, with that, we will turn our attention to another you, but not yet. <laughs> yeah, we're going to redirect the direction of the second person pronoun and say that you wrote an essay for Art Forum in 2019 titled Talk of the Town. And the opening of this essay is a description of the language classroom. You say, once a month, on the sixth floor of an old Manhattan office building, about a dozen people gather to try to speak one of the island's original languages. Our teacher is Karen Hunter, who learned Lenape as an adult on a tribal reserve in Ontario, in the company of the last native speakers and the first revivalists. 
For more than a decade, she has been driving up to 10 hours from New York and other locales to share what she knows without compensation with both indigenous people, Ramapo, Matincoc, Montauket, and interested others. These sessions at the Endangered Language Alliance, the nonprofit that I co-direct, may represent the first time Lenape has been taught in the city since the 18th century, when almost all of its speakers were driven out. Your essay was translated, actually, by a dear friend of mine into the Chinese version of Art Forum. Even the context of land struggle was more or less missing over there, or at least less articulated over there. The tragedy of linguistic diversity sacrifice for consolidated power resonate. And your practice has had me as a fan since. <laughs> In 2021, you had a residency on Governor Island where you hold two shows, Mother Tongue by Yuri Marder and the Migration Codex by Cynthia Santos Burioness, where I happened to have a residency around the same time, a couple houses down the road. It was through neighboring with you and becoming friends with your coworkers that I learned you are linguists and you are activist at the same time because you believe linguistic diversity is a matter of human right. As Laura has pointed out, as the idea of home and belonging in relation to land becomes more and more of a rarity and luxury. You don't know this, but I always think of myself as a snail and my language is my shell. Um, you will give us a rich and uh, layered and dense presentation about the rich and dense and layered strata of language underneath this very church and in this very neighborhood, in this very bureau, and in this very city. And You're about to welcome with us Ross Perlin from the Endangered Language Alliance. Sorry, just a moment, please. <laughs> Thank you so much to everyone for coming. Thank you to Mogulobo and to the Poetry Project. Yeah, I think it should be ready. Let's try it. Sorry, I know that's not very visible, but I want to start from where we are, where we're sitting. The most linguistically diverse city, not just in the world, but in the history of the world. And let's start with these specific blocks around us right now, which have seen and continue to see such an extraordinary density of linguistic phenomena from all over the world not only the sheer profusion of different languages, but also the mixed languages, the translanguaging, the code switching, the language contact. It's one thing to know in a general abstract way that there are many languages here. People will point to signs and translations, the immediate linguistic landscape around us, including names, t-shirts, tattoos, snippets of what they hear in passing. And of course, everyone can name the, the larger languages that they're hearing, English, Spanish, Mandarin, Arabic. The, the major official visible languages. But what these, these dots on here mark, although not clearly visible, just in the blocks around us, are the much lesser known languages that are also very much present here as well, even just starting from, from today. A few blocks south, a key diaspora note for the Ukrainian language, which itself is in the middle of an epical transition, having struggled just as much as the Ukrainian people to achieve recognition. Many who first came to these blocks were refugees from Soviet rule, including the New York group of Ukrainian poets who played a key role in developing Ukrainian literary modernism in the 1950s and 60s. 
And fewer know that the original core of the Ukrainian community consisted of Rusins, also known as Carpatho Rusins or Lemkos, people from the Carpathian Mountains of modern-day Ukraine, Slovakia, and Poland, who speak a distinctive continuum of Eastern Slavic languages and who continue to gather and use their endangered language at St. Nicholas Church at 288 East 10th Street. Or that this surrounding area was the first sizable, and we could say institutionally complete, immigrant neighborhood in the US operating predominantly in a language other than German, at a, uh, other than English, excuse me. It was in the mid-19th century when a wave of some 800,000 people came to the city from the Germanic-speaking lands of Central Europe before Germany was a unified country, um, speaking actually not standard German, but a huge variety of, uh, of now lesser known and, and, and indeed endangered languages such as Bavarian, Schwabian, Hessian, Württemberg, uh, Hanoverian, Low German, uh, as well as having newspapers and, 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 and magazines and events in all of these languages as well happening in, this, happening in this area and showing that you could have a neighborhood, a city, you could have a, 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 a world that was operating not in English in the developing U.S. at that time. And this in turn set the stage for these blocks around here to become home to just about every Central and Eastern European language, including a hub for a variety of Romani languages, and to become the world's major Yiddish-speaking center, with Second Avenue right here, the world center of Yiddish theater, which was banned at the time in the Russian Empire. And this in turn brought speakers of other now highly endangered Jewish languages, diaspora languages, to these blocks, including Ladino, Judeo-Greek, Judeo-Arabic, and Krimchak, all now almost gone. At Medina Masjid, the mosque on 11th and 1st, prayer is in Arabic and signs may be in Bengali, but the mother tongue for many is Sileti, the related language variety from Silet in northeastern Bangladesh. Seamen from Silet jumping ship in the 1920s and 30s, settling largely in black and Puerto Rican communities on the Lower East Side and in East Harlem, were among the first South Asians in New York at a time when immigration was severely restricted, as Vivek Bald tells in the, the wonderful book Bengali Harlem. And along the small, seemingly Indian restaurant row on East 6th Street, right here between 1st and 2nd Avenues, which began in the 1970s, the owners may speak Bengali or Sileti, while at least some of those I've met in the kitchen speak Garo, a language related to Tibetan spoken on the border where Bangladesh meets the Himalaya. A major Filipino community formed around Beth Israel Hospital on 1st on Avenue, just above 14th Street, because so many are involved in healthcare work, speaking not only Tagalog, the national language and a lingua franca, but also Cebuanu, Ilocano, and a half dozen other languages, as well as a distinctive Philippine English. And if we pan even further out, everything I've mentioned is just within a 10 minute walk of here. The stories multiply and multiply. The deep linguistic diversity of cities today is unprecedented, and nowhere more so than New York, although Toronto, is, is, is very much this kind of place as well. And it's happening precisely at a time of accelerating language loss worldwide. How can we recognize, support, and grow the approximately 800 language varieties, not to mention the innumerable sociolects, ethnolects, religiolects, idiolects, and local varieties all around us in this city at this moment? Smaller languages will have to survive in urban environments where a majority of humans, including in many places now a majority of indigenous peoples, now live if they are going to survive at all. Some may even under certain circumstances survive better in the eye of the urban storm. But will cities just be last minute outposts for endangered languages as speakers come to them? Or can they become significant sites of sustainable diversity? Can Babel work? Speaking for the Endangered Language Alliance, where I work, I want to talk a little bit about what it means to make space for indigenous minority and primarily oral languages in cities, where they have long been invisible, inaudible, out of earshot, beyond acoustic range to outsiders. Our evolving work at the Endangered Language Alliance is our answer uh, for the last 12 years. Everything from documenting and recording unrecorded languages to publishing children's books to hosting classes in languages rarely taught as well as Lenape, to working with city agencies. And tonight I'm just gonna focus on one piece of that, which is the language map of, of New York that this is uh, just a small glimpse of, um, which is, began as a print map, which is available 
here for, for donation, as well as now a digital map freely available, which I'll mention. But I want to zoom out for a second to perhaps an equally unreadable map to, to the sort of global level um, and talk a little bit about what we mean by linguistic diversity, starting with just numerical diversity, the sheer number of languages to the, to the extent that enumeration even makes sense or is possible, which is a question unto itself when you have something as fluid and flexible as language, and that's part of what we're interrogating and talking about here tonight. Linguists talk about some 7,000 languages, although there's many debates about what that, what that means. And, and here, as misleadingly as possible, one dot marks each one, one dot for English, one dot for Lenape, one dot for, for all of them, placed somehow in a quote unquote homeland. You can see how immediately misleading this is. And leaving aside the whole question of, of dialects and varieties and, and what this means. And as for the colors, they track a common measure of endangerment. Um, and at least according to this set of measures and maps developed by linguists, only 40% of the world's languages can be considered really safe. 60% of the world's languages to varying degrees endangered. Many languages like Lenape with just a single speaker and the question of what it means for a language to have just a single native speaker. So more than half are, are considered endangered to different degrees, but what matters is, is less about the number of speakers and more about intergenerational transmission. Is it being passed on to, to children? And what's happening now, and what's been increasingly recognized just in the past few decades, and finally linguists are responding to, along with activists, poets, and many others, is centuries of imperialism, capitalism, urbanization, environmental destruction, and nation building all coming to a head linguistically at this moment. And from this, obviously, certain patterns emerge. You can see certain geographic correlations, uh, the density of languages close to the equator, uh, like biodiversity, with which it patterns very closely and importantly. Deep linguistic diversity today remains strongest in remote and rugged regions, traditionally beyond the reach of empires and nation states. Mountain ranges like the Himalaya and the Caucasus, archipelagos like Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu and the Solomons, and places like the Amazon, southern Mexico, and parts of West and Central Africa. Um, but there are many, many things that go into the retention of deep, of deep diversity. All of this is under, is under great pressure, not only from English, Spanish, Mandarin, languages, large languages everyone knows are on the march, but also from Nepali, Tokpisin, and Brazilian Portuguese. Everywhere, the fate of languages and their speakers is now tied to cities, including ones on the other side of the world, which are the new linguistic hotspots, places like New York. Numerical diversity is one type, but we should also mention briefly what's been called genealogical diversity, language families, the way that languages can be grouped in sort of family trees as linguists reconstruct their origins. Um, there are approximately 400 language families in the world, but as well 130 so-called isolates, which is to say languages which have not been connected up to any particular family. Uh, now that may just be because people have not figured it out yet or there's not enough, there's not enough evidence. Uh, of course, there are famous isolates like Basque or Etruscan, Hadza from Tanzania, um, and uh, this map is a very imperfect kind of reflection of it, but um, these, these, there are whole families that as well may, 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 be, may be disappearing um, in, this, in this age of language loss. Um, and yet there are certain families which are extraordinarily, you know, have their own extraordinary stories and are extraordinarily large um, whether it's the, the, the Niger-Congo family, which covers most of Africa, to the Austronesian language family, which includes some 1,300 languages stretching from Hawaii to Madagascar, which kind of represents uh, a very kind of clear case of, of languages sort of splitting off over time as an extraordinary ocean migration happened. A last type of diversity, just to kind of reconceive what we talk about when we talk about linguistic diversity, structural diversity, the structures and features that are in different languages. Um, and just to give one, one example of tone, uh, which as this map shows, 
there's a certain distribution to the way that tone exists in different regions, uh, with the red dots here showing that really there are sort of three major regions for tonal languages in the world, in East Asia, West Africa, and, and to some extent in, in southern Mexico and Mesoamerica, and this is just a sample. Tone is the term used to describe the use of, of, of pitch patterns, uh, of course famously in Mandarin, but in, in many other languages, to distinguish individual words or the grammatical forms of words, uh, different tenses, for instance, in, in, in Mixteco, uh, an indigenous language of Mexico, can be dif differentiated by tone, different tones. Um, and uh, of course it's different from intonation. Intonation can exist in any language, but um, is, is, is much less rule-based than, than tone, which really kind of has its uh, regularities and has its uh, clear kind of grammatical role in, in the language. Um, to come back to where we are, but deeper in time, we've, we've spoken about Lenape, the indigenous language of the region, which itself was really, this is an abstraction in a way for what seems to have been uh, a chain of dialects, a continuum, uh, itself highly diverse. Uh, this shows its three sort of major um, zones, but in fact, as in many parts of the world, it was really a sort of chain where uh, people could understand their neighbors and their neighbors could understand their neighbors and so on and so on. And people had many ways to, to, to communicate with people from farther as they needed to. And multilingualism was the norm and translingualism was the norm. Um, and, uh, and today Lenape is, is, is part of a story as we've, as we've touched on a little bit, the class that we've, that we've mentioned and, and, uh, and Karen is still teaching uh, remotely now, um, teaching her language and others are teaching. Um, one of many stories of language re revitalization, which we're now in a, in a golden age of language revitalization in many ways with extraordinary efforts kind of cropping up all over. Um, by a tragic irony, the expulsion and dispossession of Lenape people started a process that ultimately made the city into a haven for peoples expelled and dispossessed from other parts of the world. So Lenape Hoking, as, as the whole Lenape region has been, has been called, was Lenape, but New Amsterdam from the earliest days um, was only partially Dutch, but was, was a place of apparently 18 languages even in its very earliest years. And nor would New York ever be completely English or NYC really American. Today, half of New Yorkers speak a language other than English at home, but you have to look beyond the major 10 or more languages, 10 or so languages which have some sort of official support from the city and have uh, you know, the largest number of speakers, each of them around 100,000 or, or more, beginning at 100,000, uh, to fathom the real depths of, of the city's diversity, which have been supercharged in particular by the expansive era of immigration that started in 1965, setting a model for the world and making the U.S. and especially New York linguistically diverse to an unprecedented degree. Hundreds of thousands of people speaking hundreds of languages have arrived from the indigenous zones of Mexico and Central America, from West Africa, from high mountain Asia, again at the very moment when languages worldwide are disappearing Many of the last speakers have been arriving in New York. This has been our motivation at the Endangered Language Alliance um, for conducting a kind of linguistic census for the first time of a city. Uh, we soon discovered that virtually none of the communities that we've been working with even officially are considered to exist in terms of any data set, the census. Uh, the census records some 100 languages or so for the city, mostly the larger national well-known languages. Um, but we knew that the communities that were missing comprised hundreds of thousands of, of people. And we had recorded over 100 languages, speakers of 100 languages, uh, none of which were supposed to exist here. Nor is this a problem unique to New York. Um, it's surely the case in most other cities, for no record of any city's languages anywhere even begins to represent what people actually speak. Majority language speakers either can't find out or can't be bothered. Um, so we started this census of our own, attempting to map the languages of the New York metropolitan area. Of course, languages can't be pinned to a map, uh, but move in the mouths of their speakers or the hands of their signers, and whole communities are constantly on the move. Nor are there universal standards for what counts as a language or makes someone a speaker. 
So this became an obsessive, endless work in progress. Um, and over five years, through thousands of interviews and discussions with community leaders, our network of, of, of speakers and activists and others, uh, we mapped over 1,200 locations, including restaurants, temples, community centers, and other significant sites where over, over 700 languages are, are used, so seven times the number that the census recorded. Um, and again, just to give sort of glimpses, this is from the print map, but there's much more density and information on the digital map, which I'll briefly show. Um, so there are these kind of microcosms, global microcosms, which, uh, which emerge um, and uh, that you see that in this city where one out of every 10 languages uh, from the whole planet is, is spoken at least by some small community. Um, and you know, many of the communities are, 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 are substantial. And the picture of the city that emerges when you look with a linguistic lens is perhaps quite different from what people would imagine otherwise. Nearly 40% of, of the city's languages are from Asia, a quarter from Africa, just under 20% each from Europe and the Americas, and then a small fraction from Oceania and the Pacific. Um, what may seem kind of like an explosion of names, which are also in the, in the, the scripts and languages themselves, um, actually is full of patterns. Um, so color is, color is used just to distinguish region, um, but what you begin to see are these complex interaction zones, these places where languages and speakers are coming into contact, where one community settles near another uh, or after another in sort of succession patterns, where there are linguistic, historical, cultural, religious, national, or other kinds of connections. Uh, so instead of homogeneous enclaves, when people think of, oh, this is an enclave, this is an enclave, this is an enclave, uh, what the map really reveals are whole global regions shrunk down and recreated in miniature in individual city neighborhoods. So in central Queens, it's the languages of South Asia and the Himalaya, then further east, those of, uh, of East and Southeast Asia. Um, and across the city, but perhaps most completely in Queens, there are you know, large clusters of indigenous Latin American languages, uh, Mixteco, Quichua, Quiche, Mam, and Nahuatl being some of the largest. And just to briefly show some others, the whole kind of world of the Soviet Union um, recomposed in, in South Brooklyn, along with uh, the fading Jewish diaspora, which is assembled with all of its languages along Ocean Parkway. Uh, nearby is, 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 a, is, is the new Brooklyn Queens Silk Road, where peoples from across the Middle East, the Caucasus, and Central Asia are mixing and meeting and negotiating complex linguistic identities, neighborhoods and, and, and scenarios and situations where four or five languages are um, a minimum constantly in play. Uh, over 100 West African languages spread across Harlem and, and the Bronx um, within just a five mile radius of, of Yankee Stadium, uh, and yet for the most part invisible. Uh, as in Africa itself, colonial languages re remaining dominant in so many ways, French uh, in both its official and local West African forms, English both as imposed by the British and as it, ha as it has evolved in Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, and elsewhere. Um, Arabic through, through Islam, um, but it's really cross-border linguistic ties uh, of Manding people, of Fulani people, uh, of Soninke people that tell you much more than the, than the nation state borders and are recomposed uh, and recreated here, here in the city's neighborhoods. Um, so just to give a glimpse of the, of the, digital, of the digital version, which has all of this and more and the stories of each of these communities and is all kind of freely available and then recordings uh, of many of the languages as well. Um, invite you to, to, to take a look when you get a chance. Um, and, and then just to share that in the few years that, 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 that the map has existed, um, what we've found is that language mapping and, and making space for indigenous minority and primarily oral languages in hyper-diverse cities is, is not just an academic act. It's not just a, a, map, a matter of, of documentation and mapping, um, but it's, it's about bringing resources um, to communities that use these languages. It's about translation and interpretation and access to information. Um, of course, the choice of whether to be visible or not visible um, always is, 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 to the, is to the community, um, but for the most part, the reaction people have had is that, uh, that they want to be seen and they want their languages to be heard and to have a, a place and a, and a site 
um, in the city. So we hope that, that there will be the tools and the capacity for people to dictate the terms of their own visibility and audibility towards achieving recognition, towards language access, and for us all, towards building a linguistic infrastructure that makes Babel work before it's too late. Thank you. What do you think? <laughs> Thank you, Ross. I thought that was such a beautifully painterly way to think about um, languages, and especially it's very difficult to think in network terms. And you gave us um, several different ways to approach the question of networked languages. Um, so I really appreciated that. And it was a great way to open um, this program. Um, your face are not visible to me. But I want to assume that you're enjoying this so far as I am. Thank you. Um, you probably have experienced this too. It's a great privilege to curate as we just email our idols and we can get their private lectures. Um, you and me had a conversation about Walter Benjamin where I mentioned that my mentor criticized me for reading him as poetry because Benjamin didn't want me to he wanted me to go to a revolution after reading him, but not to go writing. But I think I might just made a similar mistake because for me, I think this is poetry. And to your definition of poetry, the slogan of Poetry Project, poetry is sustain people and place. And I think this is precisely that. So will you join me in one more round of applause for <laughs> Ross Perlin and his work? <laughs> at the Endangered Language Alliance. Um, you. <laughs> you were at a residency in 2019 at the Museum of Art and Design. Your studio was next to mine. Your material was leather and your tool was metal. The sound of your working was audible to me and of course the style of you <laughs> moving in and of that place was impressive. Um, your style <laughs> contains many visual symbols, bodily signs. It is so attractive because it contains so much information, information that are not so much legible to me as a lack of context. A dazzling visual yet distanced context made in me a fascination of you. <laughs> Later that year, you were invited to do a window display at Printed Matter, my last workplace. You brought flowers made with paper. You were inspired by Diego Rivera. Uh, you used the imagery of Lily. And with them, you arranged a grand arc that speaks so much strength and resilience even with this gentle floral imagery. You and Yuchen and I had this uh, branching conversation on Zoom about bricks, where we riffed off the resonances of an individual brick that can be thrown ballistically or symbolically to shatter a paradigm. Or a brick can be an emplacement in collectivity, strengthening a structure that's only craftable by a multitude working in tandem. And you all know Pink Floyd's lyric, Another Brick in the Wall, is usually used as a rebel call against conformism. But it can also be seen as a rallying call for this dissolution into collective power. And we're excited to hear also more about bricks from you today. Um, you have showed me a different facade every time I reach out to you for a different scene. How many facades do you have there in total? I don't know. You told me you were going to study oral history when I first met you, and now you are a historian. You showed me a new word the other day called ethnopoetics, which is a methodology where not only the legible words were taken into consideration by the tone, the facial expression, the gesture, the breath in between utterances are all included and represented. 
um, you are about to experience such a interdisciplinary and uh, multi-sensory um, presentation. So prepare your ears, your eyes, and your breath, and join us in welcoming Tamara Santibanez. Wow, thank you for that. That was so beautiful. I think that we're good to go. I don't know. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me and for this beautiful and, and such a thoughtful program. Um, so, as they mentioned, I'm going to be talking to you about BRICS today, uh, which is a new site for me to be exploring and to be thinking about. Um, and I was a little nervous to bring it into this space because this is my first time really talking to an audience about it uh, or to be presenting it publicly. And so I hope that you'll all stay with me uh, as I meander and ask you all some questions and ask myself some questions. Um, I just finished in... MA program um, in oral history, which was a really foreign place for me to be because I, um, I'm an artist. I've never had an office job. I've never really bound, been bound by the conventions of form in that way. And, um, and so being invited to present this project in this space of poets I think was the perfect place because I've had the experience that when I spoke about bricks to people in my program, they wanted me to say more. Um, they really wanted me to explain it and to give a conclusion about it. Um, and nothing about this idea has felt tidy to me and um, poets really understand that. <laughs> um, I've been starting so many conversations recently by asking people about this question that you see here. What do you know of bricks? Um, and everyone has something to tell me about, about them, which has helped this concept continue to grow and is a question that I, I love to ask. Um, but the questions that I wanna bring into the space today uh, and that I hope you'll think about as you're listening to the audio that I'm gonna present are, do you know a brick when you hear it? And can you feel a brick as it's happening? So what I knew about bricks when I was young or since I have been young and I'm outing myself, maybe St. Mark's Church is the perfect place to do it, but as a young anarchist and a young punk arrived to New York, I came to a punk show that was in the courtyard um, and the singer for a punk band that I knew and loved was in the courtyard screaming <laughs> aggressively and I was so enamored and enchanted by New York and by that moment. Um, but what I knew about bricks as a punk and as an anarchist was of a brick as a disruptive force. And what I knew about bricks as a queer person was that a brick initiated a movement by being the, the moment and the action at Stonewall that engendered the civil rights um, struggle. And so I knew of bricks and I, they were familiar to me as this thing that was a sort of a site of initiation and an action that was simultaneously disruptive and generative. Um, and that was what I was calling when I began to think of these oral history moments as bricks. Um, and since I started to think about this, I can't stop looking at bricks and I can't stop looking at, you know, these type of, this type of etched graffito on bricks, um, crushed bricks that I see on the sidewalk, images of bricks that I see in, in photographs and in artwork and I see them everywhere because they are everywhere. They're ubiquitous and they hold so much um, 
cultural symbolism in so many ways and, and there's so much to explore there that I hope we can think through together. Um, bricks are at this point memed. <laughs> um, and my co-star app told me this about bricks two days ago, um, which felt a little too on the nose and I, I had to bring it into this <laughs> space with me today. Um, but this also starts to gesture towards the mythology, um, the, the spectacle of the brick, which is something that I think is incredibly powerful about it and, and unique to it. Um, so as, as Yu Chen mentioned, I am now an oral historian. <laughs> uh, and I came to that because of my practice as a tattoo artist, because to me, tattooing is about, uh, it's an embodied way to access narrative, an embodied way to record storytelling, and it's a form of, of physical archiving. Um, and so beginning to study oral history was exciting to me because I got to just ask people about themselves without tattooing as this mediating force that needed a lot of my attention. Um, but what I was troubled by in oral history, um, and what I continue to be troubled by at times, is the, the sort of storytelling um, economy that we find ourselves in today, right? About podcasts, about sound bites, about, um, you know, oral history has so many noble aims. Uh, it's so often used towards preserving histories, preserving legacies, towards uh, recording radical movements towards, uh, you know, the language, the, the language that's often used is uplifting marginalized voices. Um, and what I found myself troubled by was the isolation of stories in the service of supposedly humanizing or eliciting empathy. And, and Sadia Hartman has written so powerfully on the troubles with, with empathy and how they ask us to substitute our own consciousness in the place of another, rather than creating more space for another person. Um, what I was specifically frustrated by was often the, um, was that I felt like I was seeing the, this sort of humanity and political lived political knowledge as being in, in opposition to each other and in odds with one another. Um, and that isolating these humanistic moments required denying a larger context and denying people of their political knowledge when people who are most, are most impacted by systems have a keen understanding of why those conditions are the way that they are. Um, and the interviews that I've been doing over the past year that sort of produced this, this project, um, or these ideas about bricks are interviews with people who have experiences at the intersection of tattooing and the prison industrial complex in, in a number of ways, um, which is a site that is so exciting to me as a place to investigate bodily autonomy, to investigate resistances to state mechanisms of oppression and to state control of the body, to uh, erasure of individual um, self-expression, um, the isolation of prison in um, denying communication, denying personal stylistic expression, um, and tattooing being this medium that, um, that could push back against all of those things, um, oftentimes with, with severe consequences. And so um, that feels important to name, that, that, that those exchanges and those, those questions, those encounters were what produced these moments that I was hearing as bricks, because I kept hearing these moments and, and thinking, um, this moment in this life is a brick. From what I know of bricks, this is a moment that is simultaneously disruptive and generative. It's a site of reorientation. Um, it's a place where, where a change and a possibility and a rerouting can occur. Because at the same time, I was finding myself so frustrated by, um, you know, not only these limitations of oral history or the sort of, um, the sort of mechanisms by which stories were being created and, and curated, but also, um, by what I felt was the totality of these systems that were oppressed by. Um, you know, there was so, there was such an explosion of, of movement, of energy, of anger, um, and of passion and action towards changing our world. And I felt, I found myself feeling so discouraged at times by how enmeshed we were with these systems, right? It's like, um, you know, trying to get myself to stop shopping at Amazon <laughs> and just noticing all of the ways that this one thing is, this one company is, is entangled with, with my life, right? Um, and how, how complex it is to disentangle yourself from these systems. Um, and reflecting on this brick metaphor, I, I really thought about um, 
a small opening. You know, I thought about a wall. I thought about all of the ways that walls are immovable, that walls um, separate us from other people in both physical and metaphorical senses, the ways that even the word wall became sort of a slur in this political climate um, as a, a shorthand for dividing us from others, of keeping people away from our, ourselves, excluding people, deporting people. Um, and, and I started to feel that a, that a, you know, a single brick has this type of mobility that a wall does not. A single brick can, um, can rupture, it can smash a window, it can, um, it can initiate something new and something different, and the wall may still exist, but maybe this brick, maybe there is something here. Um, and so I wrote this practice, <laughs> this listening practice, um, which is to imagine a brick wall spanning your entire field of vision to imagine one brick removed from the wall and to ask yourself what you can glimpse through that brick's absence and what it is that you see on the other side. And the second half of that practice is to imagine that someone hands you their brick. They hand you this moment that is disruptive and generative in their life. Um, and to feel their palm touching yours and to concentrate on the weight of their brick that you now hold. Um, and to ask yourself, what will you do with it? Will you throw it? Will you bear its weight? Um, and so I'm gonna play a piece of audio that to me is a brick. Um, and I would love for us to listen together while holding those questions. We might need um, the, the alternate sound option. Okay, yeah. I, I got that tattoo at, at, at Stonehenge uh, some, somewhere between like the, the couple days before, a couple, couple days after summer solstice, 1984. And it was a trip, man. I mean, there, there, that, that, that two week, 10 day to two week period, I mean, at Stonehenge with Hell's Angels and punks and 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 rockers um, it, and there were black flags flying and you know there was vegan food and people were doing drugs and sort of ten day period of of mutual aid and even though there were so many different it wasn't any violence. I mean, it was like Hell's Angels and Rastafarians and punks and all these people hanging out together and and taking care of themselves and each other and not having conflict. It was felt very revolutionary uh, and 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 very freeing. Um, so that audio is from a two-hour interview that I did, part one of two two-hour interviews with my friend Bernie Living, who is a social worker. He is turning 60 this year, and he has been a social worker for 25 years, I believe. Um, what I think is important to note about that piece is that he... Um, as if that was the last year that that festival happened, as he mentioned, because there was a notoriously violent police suppression of travelers to that festival the following year uh, in an incident that's known as the Battle of the Beanfield. Um, so what felt important to me was to 
find a way to name all of those things on all sides, to, to see the, the wall around this brick, um, because that story isn't what it is without those things. And there's a lot of concerns in oral history about preserving narrator privacy. Um, there are a lot of questions about the ethics um, of making things accessible. And of course, there's people who argue for open access as being the most transparent, the most egalitarian, um, and the most just. But that certainly doesn't take into account that so many narrators are more at risk and more vulnerable because of that increased visibility. Um, and so there are so many negotiations with archives that occur. There are so many um, caveats that are placed on, on audio. Um, to try to maintain that sense of safety for narrators. And so um, what I did with these pieces, these bricks, was I created um, what are called ethnopoetic transcriptions, inviting, hoping to invite a, a very, very close and detailed listening, right? So hoping to honor these moments in the ways that I felt that they deserved. Um, you can't see, you really can't see it in this slide. Um, but the way that these poems are navigated is also that you can click through to key terms and access other parts of the full interview that are time stamped. So you see that there was a dialogue there. You get additional information that speaks to, um, you know, how Bernie came to the UK. It speaks to him being arrested for um, for freeing many dogs from an animal testing facility, which he describes as a, a crime of, of love. Um, and, uh, and in keeping with this idea of bricks and brick walls, I, I wanted to provide access, provide the, the bricks, the building blocks that shape the story around this, this moment in either direction, in all directions, um, while still preserving the narrator's full story and trying to find a way to share what needed to be shared to honor his political knowledge that he was naming, um, while still giving him a sense of agency and, and secrecy as he wanted to have. Um, and, and sort of by the same token, I started to think in the same way about keyword listings, which are um, sort of a metadata tool that oral historians use in archiving to access uh, or to enable access to people's stories, right? So you can get a general sense of what they're speaking about. Um, and I became so fascinated by these because they felt like these very incomplete portraits um, of what people's lives were and what people's narration was. The, the thing that really, uh, I think, romances me about oral history as a, as a practice and as a medium is that it is, um, it's a unique happening in and of itself. And a lot of people consider it to be its own historical moment because a story is never told the same way twice. Um, this retelling and the storytelling and the interviewing, the exchange is so subjective because you'll tell the story to me a different way than you might tell the story to a police officer. You might tell the story differently to your mother than you might to a stranger. Um, you might tell me the same story differently five years from now than you would today. And oral history places specific value on all of those things, seeing them not as flaws, but as strengths of this medium because even in misrememberings, in different tellings, in con self-contradictory retellings, we find the ways that we make meaning um, and we find the ways that we assign value. And so, to me, I, I feel as if oral history is, as a medium, is a, is a brick. It's this single moment, this singular representation of a space, of a retelling of something important that is surrounded by all of the other elements that enable it. I'm also, I also am particularly, uh, I really love this one because I think there's something so unique about describing yourself by telling about all the bands that you've seen. Um, and so I've been continuing to make bricks and make paintings of bricks and looking at bricks and asking people about bricks. Um, and these are some ceramic bricks that I made. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the fragility of these brick moments um, and about the contradictions that exist um, 
within this idea of the brick as a site of potential liberation or, um, or an invitation to an otherwise. Uh, because simultaneously the brick is also a symbol of labor, sometimes of, um, of oppressive labor. Uh, like I mentioned, it's also a symbol of, of walls, of borders, of carceral ar um, architecture, um, and of hostile architecture. And, um, and so again, this is a, a metaphor. It's a, it's a tool, it's an invitation that isn't, isn't tidy, but that I think is what is drawing me into it and what's bringing me back to it again and again. Um, I've been holding these really fragile bricks, thinking about these stories that people have told me. Um, a brick inside another brick, you know, opening this brick to reveal another brick, this piece by Robert Amison, which I really love. Um, and there's so many visual artists who are working with this, this form that I am so excited by. Um, Rafael Sparza is making these adobe bricks um, and building these structures within white wall gallery and museum structures um, and raising these really important questions about um, sanitation in those spaces uh, because they're made of adobe there is a lot of gallery and institutional concern about potential contaminants um, Estra choked by the nearby Prene. So saying as it rise, Ross Colander. One, two, three, um, a parte. Jazz two. Keen or mastoy janitor dam ingor. Dam dam door claw may still jubilation gives. Picture of a halibut who liked gives. Picture of wallet. Ah, 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 ah. Maskin sha a picture theros ingor. Picture please. Flank clock clock. One view prene. Picture of e spirit papa jf jazz two. All power, all greetings, fans calendar. Kes Ross Estra, hard to that colander. Co Salamander, piss goblet gives. Furnace last confusion, ah, or jazz too. High noon, boys, because. Fold in another bright rise taste, Prene. In it without laws surrounds Ingor. Scara Jazz 2, Scarana Clonander. Greenville Ingor, Gia and Go So Gives. Art Doy, Prene.
signage. I like what the if is doing here, if by here I mean that something is doing, but if I mean what, then the here likes the as is. Somewhat things the by, I like if and only where the here does the that. Without is where the if is doing its here, then while what likes isn't and over there. Back here looks longingly by on over, as I mean to bring the here to that. If the if does when it likes, then I mean the here but is. Back as when in meaning does it. The up does it, not, and on where. Why the or and who? Thereas, if liking is what the here does, then I am too. And finally, I would like to call on Yuchen, Fan, and Ross to perform the third sestina. explain the um, diagram with you. This one is normal speed. This one is long vowels. This one, each sentence starts loud and gradually fades out. This one is long pause in between words. This one is as fast as possible. And we're back to normal, okay? We only have one sheet? Yeah. Okay. Two, three, go. Sonto Bo Mado, Bulaco, Dino Tambo Dovon Sismo Sato Zia ish dios ai kili 
greeting. Zia ish dios ai kili gritin. Dino tombo do vom sismo. Nimas ihas ahilas nishawa. Moju bofu dolor du moloko. Salto bo mados pulasho chibo. In my hash I bin of nishawa. It's the greeting that shows when in moloku. My heart in sismo and beats for chibo. Anyone who wants to read their haikus, um, feel free to take a minute and complete it. Oh my god, some have uh, rewritten Finnegan's Wake. Caress top, listen middle echo, blister freeze perks in distinctive puja. Who's a what's a lava Botox jump? Can I read another one? Guba Dukas, Prague Basliang, and such. Zuba Nesta Languidina Pakanal Drishti Niam Sako Upta Vandlaki Kinta Enspaka. I feel our mission is accomplished. You have my vows and the vows of Nick. <laughs> Any last takers for haiku? Yes, we've got a few more. Sun signs remembrance. My skin pores still sweat your name. Deafening silence. Anyone else? Yes. Do you mind coming up? I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> this is not a haiku, okay. but it's a, a sense of what I've experienced here. A man walks into a mirror and says, excuse me. I'll read three. Wait, are we writing? Pretty sure I did it wrong, but that is okay. Everyone wants it, to be seen for who they are, cured of father wound. I wasn't present. Were they reading Latin? How very classic. <laughs> Thank you all for um, joining us tonight in this journey from um, deep sociology into the deep unconscious of language. Um, there will be two more nights. Uh, tomorrow night is have, under the theme of have, and the third night is under the theme of my word. And we have most, more amazing performers and artists on those nights, same time. Um, thank you for the sound. Thank you for the image. Thank you for everything. <laughs> thank you for managing our retail business. And uh, 
Something to think about if you're coming back tomorrow. Something always confused me. What does it mean to have sex? And what does it mean when you say, thank you for having me? Thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you, Poetry Project. Thank you to the captioner. And there are some items on sale from Tamara and Ross uh, by donation and for sale. So thank you all. We wish you all a beautiful, sleepy night. Really don't mind if you sit this one out My words but a whisper, a deafness, a shout I may make you feel, but I can't make you think 